Welcome to a large model showman's engine. This is part 28, looking inside the photograph album. Thanks to the efforts of Mr Simon Hudson of the Steam Workshop and Raymond, the previous owner of the engine, I received this with the engine. And it really is a nice thing to look at. The photographs catalogue the building of this engine and according to the dates in this photograph album, this engine, believe it or not, was completed in one year. Here's one of the rear wheels under construction. Not the easiest thing in the world to do. I assume this gentleman to be the builder, and I believe his name to be Mike Robinson. These are the strakes on the wheels. Can you imagine how long this took to rivet everyone in position? Here's the wheel nearing completion. All of these metal strakes on each of the rear wheels are now hidden, because the wheels have rubber tyres fitted. This is an early photograph, it must be a work in progress photograph, featuring two rear wheels and two front wheels, and the builder is trying to figure out where the steering wheel goes. In this picture, with the help of a very powerful gas blowtorch, I do believe that the copper sheet is being annealed, and it must have got pretty hot in the workshop that day. This clip shows the copper mounted onto a former, ready for the shaping of the plates. Well, at least one of them. This photograph shows forming another part of the boiler. I have a great deal of respect for anyone who can make a thing like this. One major disadvantage when making large model boilers is the fact that as you build the boiler, it gets increasingly heavy until you cannot lift it. And this clip shows the boiler clamped to the milling machine for levelling off every one of the side plate bushes. In this close-up you can see that a fly cutter in the milling machine is doing the cutting. I don't quite know what's going on in this photograph, it looks to me like the builder's having a nap. And after wrestling with a thing of this size I'm not surprised he's having a nap. In this photograph, as you can see, the side plates have been fitted. And now for something completely different. This photograph shows the setup in the lathe for forming or spinning the copper top for the chimney. This is a wooden former in the chuck, and by using a lot of lubrication and a special round-nosed non-cutting tool, the copper is persuaded to take on the same shape as the wooden former. And that's easier said than done. The builder of this engine was a bit special in the engineering department. As you'll see later on in the photographs, originally this traction engine was fitted with a siren as well as a whistle. When I bought the engine, it was just fitted with a whistle, no siren. But I changed the whistle anyway because I didn't like the sound of it. This photograph shows the cylinder casting having some work done in the milling machine. And it looks like the builder cut his own gears. As it says on the blank, it's the second shaft fast gear. This photograph's a bit of a puzzle. It looks like the front part of the engine. But on the engine as I have it now, and later on in these photographs, you will see the axle beam is different. This rear view is very recognisable. Same water pump, same water bypass valve, same water gauge, same reversing lever, the only difference being that in this clip the engine is fitted with a spoked flywheel, whereas now it's fitted with a solid flywheel. In this photograph the engine has some things on it that aren't on it anymore. As I mentioned previously, one of the parts is the axle beam at the front, and the other part is this fancy bit on the cylinder. I don't know what that is. I've been doing quite a lot of work on the paintwork, and I've had to lay on the floor to work on it. This is a good idea. Tie ropes to it and hoist it into the air. But if I tried this in my workshop, the traction engine would remain on the floor and the roof would come down. It's definitely safer for me to lay on the floor underneath the traction engine with a paintbrush, with the traction engine also on the floor. This looks suspiciously like a photograph of a steam test, and the location of the traction engine looks like it's in an industrial estate. And as I also mentioned earlier, because of the time scale of the build, this had to have been built by a pro. If you've been following this series, you will notice, of course, that I've been working on the engine for a while now, and I'm finding that the engineering standard throughout this is very good indeed. The previous owner mentioned to me that there was a riding assembly that clipped onto the back of the engine, but unfortunately this didn't come with the engine, but really it's just as well. It wasn't really strong enough to carry my weight. I'm having one built that has its own wheels very shortly. This is a nice photograph, obviously the man who built it, Mr Mike Robinson, 
sat in front of this miniature masterpiece. In the next few photographs, the engine looks like it's at some sort of a rally. You will notice it's fitted with the extension chimney to take the smoke over people's heads instead of asphyxiating the people who are watching it. The next set of photographs show the construction of the canopy. I don't know who built the canopy, whether it was Mike Robinson or someone else, but it's beautifully made. Here's a close-up of the front of the cylinder. I wonder what happened to the fancy brass plate on the front of it. Once again, here's a photograph of the canopy, and this time it's upside down, having the lights fitted to the light rails. Here it is the correct way up, and the two removable hatches hadn't been fitted at this stage. Try and stay calm, because now it's painting time. This is the black painting, and this is the red painting. This traction engine is beautifully painted, and most of the paint has stood the test of time. 24 years later, I'm only repairing physical damage. I don't have too many details about the engine, apart from the photograph album, and I wonder if the builder painted it. And I wonder who lined it. I find lining impossible. This is freehand lining. I've tried it, but I'm not so good at it. This photograph shows the front axle beam, and it's the same one that is currently fitted to the engine. And once again, after the lining, here's the builder stood behind it. This photograph is interesting. At the time it was taken, the engine had an entirely different name, and I don't know what's written on the side, I can't make it out. That's it for the photographs. Here's some details as to when it was started and finished and first steamed. Before I go, I would like to thank Mike Robinson for building such a superb engine. My thanks also go to Raymond, the previous owner of the engine, and of course Simon Hudson at the Steam Workshop. And that's it, the last page in the book. All that remains is to say, stay safe, stay well, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it interesting. Please take the time to visit my main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back, making it unnecessary to comment that the videos are too short.